Okay, um, I think we're good to go, Rob. Thank you, Teresa. And welcome, everyone. Very pleased to be able to speak with you this afternoon. YSI is committed to uh, helping you get the best data out of the instrumentation products you uh, trust to purchase from us. Um, today, in particular, we're talking about preventing fouling of online wastewater sensors. And even more particular, we're talking about two particular types of sensors, both optical. One type of optical on the bottom left use measures uh, scattered light to uh, dis measure and display suspended solids in wastewater treatment processes. Another type of sensor uses, on the bottom right there, uses a measurement of absorbed light to measure important uh, parameters in wastewater, including nitrate, COD, and even uh, also suspended solids. Okay, just give us a moment here. Um, for some reason, our slides aren't progressing, so um, it'll just be a moment, and we'll, we'll get the slides working again. Okay, sorry for that. Um, I think the, my computer must have went to sleep. I hope you stay awake for the whole hour. Um, so today's topics, uh, as I mentioned, op optical measurement of wastewater process parameters with scattered light or absorbance. And we'll talk about the measurement principles of each type of sensor, uh, probe operation and care, measurement interferences, fouling prevention and removal. We'll also have some demonstrations of ultra clean technology which is uh, built into YSI IQ SensorNet sensors. Then I'll have some closing thoughts, including an example of an application where uh, suspended solids can be used to control uh, wastewater treatment. And as, as I mentioned, uh, this is these sensors are intended for process monitoring of wastewater treatment. So to start with, solids detection with scattered light. With a uh, in, in this uh, cartoon here, we, we see this uh, lamp shining light into a sample with solids in it. And uh, those solids are different sizes, shapes, uh, maybe even different materials. But you can see that uh, the light is hits those solids and is reflected in all different directions. Some light even passes through. That reflection uh, or scattering depends on a lot of things. So for one thing, uh, the type of particle has an effect. So for example, uh, some particles uh, will absorb more of that light. So if you think of a, uh, a glass, a piece of glass might be more likely to reflect uh, light than um, absorb it. Concentration, uh, then the number of particles or the density of the particles in the sample uh, will impact how that light is scattered. The size of the particles, now you, you can think of a uh, couple of different samples. You could, if you got maybe very large particles uh, or very small particles, um, very large particles uh, might have different optical properties than, than the small prop particles. And so even for a sample that had the same concentration, you could get different uh, signal from the sensors. Shape of particles. Um, and so you can see in this example, um, so imagine I guess a perfectly round a sphere. Um, you would expect maybe that you'd get a very uniform or uh, consistent reflection. 
as the light hit that uh, particle. On the other hand, when you've got uh, irregular shaped solids, asymmetrical type solids, uh, that light, and kind of in the picture it shows over there, is going to be scattered very differently depending on which particle it hits at which angle. And lastly, the wavelength of the light is, is important. If we uh, think of light as, as a wave, as it is, um, with peaks and valleys, uh, a longer wavelength light, you can imagine, might actually miss some of the smallest particles in the sample. On the other hand, uh, shorter wavelengths of light, uh, when we think maybe in the visible range, would be more likely to be affected by the color in the sample. One thing I want to emphasize, though, is this type of sensor is not a direct measurement of the number or concentration of particles. And that is a very important concept because you can have two different samples with different properties. Um, with, you could end up with very different results um, even though the concentrations of samples are the same. In the same way, if you have two different instruments where the optics are designed differently, you might ex wouldn't be surprised that the measurement you get from one with a certain type of optics is different than you get from the other with a different type of optics. So uh, that very important uh, to remember. When it comes to absorbed light, uh, we can detect things like solids, but also nitrate and COD, for example, if we measure in the ultraviolet range. But the design of an absorbed light sensor is, is a little different in that you, you still have a lamp, but you're shining light into the sample. And that light has an intensity, call it I sub zero or I naught. And so uh, the light that passes through that sample has a slightly lower intensity, call it I. And that's what reaches the detector. So in the simplest calculation, percent transmission is that intensity of the light as it hits the detector divided by the intensity of the light emitted by the lamp times 100. So if you are used to monitoring UVT in uh, effluent samples, for example, that is a direct uh, use of that formula with light at uh, usually 254 nanometers, but you could apply that to any and all different wavelengths. On the other hand, A for absorption is a similar but different measurement. We still use the light hitting the detector and the light emitted by the lamp. We take the log of that and that gives us an absorbance. And what that does is it gives us a much wider range of linearity in order to develop a sensor to um, measure the important parameters. So uh, absorbance is uh, very useful that way. But it's really very, I want you to understand it's very similar to the percent transmittance. So the next section uh, we have here is on probe operation and care. It's always important when you, you order a sensor, and you know, normally we're talking about a monitoring system that's going to cost thousands of dollars to understand how it works. And so uh, modern process instruments use digital technology. And, and the importance of that is, is that um, the signal is uh, measured by the sensor, but then that signal is also processed by the sensor. And so with digital technology, as we've come to get used to, uh, you have a lot of different options for uh, optimizing that uh, displayed measurement. So for example, uh, measurement mode, there's uh, things to consider there. So parameter, um, turbidity and total suspended solids are two different parameters that use the measurement of scattered light. There are sensors out there that will do both 
reading. So obviously you need to know uh, what's more important to you, the turbidity value in NTU or FNU, or if you really need a suspended solids concentration in milligram per liter. Units, uh, similarly, a, a very similar discussion there is um, even if you do want, let's say, suspended solids, you have a choice maybe of milligram per liter or percent solids. And they each have their own application. Uh, type of factory calibration. Because it is digital technology and because the signal processing is in the sensor, uh, there can be factory calibrations programmed in the sensor. So in the case of IQ SensorNet, in this example, the, the V-Solid sensor has two uh, factory calibrations. Uh, a matrix type 1, which is for mixed liquor suspended solids, and a matrix type 2, which is more applicable to um, primary sludge, for example. Also, signal averaging. Now, you can imagine the speed of light being what it is. Uh, a sensor can take a measurement uh, within a second or less. It just takes the amount of time for the light to travel into the sample and be reflected back. But that is really much faster than you need a measurement to be. And so uh, instantaneous changes in that signal can cause a noisy signal. So uh, signal averaging is important. Basically, what you're telling a sensor is, how many measurements should I average in to calculate the measurement which is actually displayed? And we'll give a, a very useful demonstration of that shortly. Automatic cleaning or cleaning. type and frequency. Um, if you are using air cleaning, for example, uh, that air cleaning cannot be on continuously because it's going to interfere with your measurement. So you're going to program it to activate uh, every 10 minutes, maybe every hour, maybe every two hours. And last on the list there is user calibration, and I have in parentheses if needed. As I mentioned before, there are factory calibrations programmed into the V-Solid and, and other solid sensors like it. But if you have a uh, sample which doesn't quite match the properties of mixed liquor or primary sludge, for example, or maybe you need a slightly higher uh, accuracy, uh, or then you can fine-tune that with a user calibration. And there, there are ways to do that. But out of the box, um, the sensor is, would be ready to measure with a few uh, minor programming adjustments. When it comes to maintenance and verification, maintenance of course is always important and uh, cleaning of course uh, comes to mind. That is, you know, maybe the number one question that customers have for us when they say, uh, how often am I going to need to, to clean a sensor? And so I mentioned that there are automatic cleaning devices uh, possible on solid sensors or uh, absorbent style sensors, but there is really no substitute for manual cleaning. Now, the manual cleaning hopefully will be much less frequently than it would be with the automatic cleaning, but it, it's good to adopt a routine program for at least checking on the sensor, whether that be uh, weekly, uh, we have customers that uh, go months between uh, checking it. Maybe that's a little too long, but uh, really it's whatever works for the customer. Sampling and reference with a lab measurement is, is also important. Um, now you may say, okay, I bought this solid sensor, so I didn't have to do that anymore. Well, um, the real uh, value of having a sensor so you can do it less, do those reference measurements less frequently. You're going to want to prove uh, to yourself uh, that, that the sensor is working at all times. I mean, there are instances where the sensor becomes damaged. There are instances where, you know, how will you know if the sensor is fouled, for example? So what we say is we have a customer maybe that's used to doing mixed liquor grab samples and measurement every shift, a three-shift operation. 
maybe you can cut that down to daily or every other day. If you're used to doing uh, measurements every day, maybe every week, or if it's weekly measurements, um, even longer than that. So uh, the picture there shows the proper procedure for collecting the grab sample. You know, you've got your sample dipper, and you want to um, dip this sample dipper into the sample very nearby where the sensor is, obviously. You want to get as close an approximation of what the uh, sensor is as, as you can. When it comes to actually doing the measurement, though, uh, there is uh, this uh, flow sheet here which describes uh, how to get solids reference measurements. So if we stop, start at the very top where it says a sample in the oval there, uh, if we take that sample, pour it into a dish, put it into an oven at 103 to 105 degrees, See, evaporate off the wall. It states the total solids in the measurement. That includes both suspended solids and dissolved solids. Um, if we instead take that sample and pour it through a glass fiber filter, and, and we then evaporate water off that filter, which are and the solids are retained in that filter again at 103 to 105 degrees C, and then measure the weight and in increase, we get total suspended solids. So in this case, that suspended solids uh, is not a measure of dissolved solids. It's because that is in the permeate differences in solids measurements, total suspended solids versus total solids. And they each have uh, particular applications. Um, the lower part of that has to do with volatile solids. Um, we don't have a sensor to measure. Uh, volatile solids. Um, so the uh, uh, volatile suspended solids, as I mentioned, is a, is a different different measurement. We're talking today about total solids and total suspended solids. Okay, so. Um, Let's say you, you, you try to do your verification measurement and it doesn't agree with your reference measurement, uh, which means that assuming that you're doing the reference measurement properly and the grab sampling properly, there are measurement interferences. So let's talk about the causes of measurement error. One is sample environment properties. So if you can imagine with, a, for example, a scattered light measurement, anything in the environment, a wall or the wall of a pipe uh, that reflects that light back into the detector is going to, the sensor is going to think that is part of the sample when in fact it isn't. Aging or drift of sensor electronics. Uh, this, this happens. Uh, nothing is, uh, stays stable forever. Uh, so as the optics uh, drift, that will cause, could cause some error. Uh, fouling of the sensor, you know, anything that gets uh, on that sensor that interferes with either uh, passage of the light into the sample or interferes with the ability of the scattered light, for example, to get to the detector. Those could be two different effects. And of course, actual drift of the process. While it's, uh, we like to think that um, our processes are very stable at all times, when we first see that maybe a measurement is not quite uh, in agreement with what our expectations are, many times we'll immediately go to our measurement device and, and try to figure out, okay, what's wrong with that? But in fact, uh, sometimes it is the actual drift of the process. And I want to give you a couple of examples. We had a, a customer who uh, used polymer for dewatering, um, overdose of the polymer, didn't really impact the process so much, but there was, uh, shortly after that overdose, they noticed an uh, offset in the solids measurement, which was attributed to that uh, polymer dosage. 
Um, in that case, a user calibration corrected that error. Um, in another example, a different style of technology, uh, the operator noticed that um, the reading was much higher than it should have been and uh, something was, was wrong, went out there, checked on it, and in fact, uh, the, the process solid concentration had increased and uh, fortunately for them, they caught it in time. That's the, the value of an online sensor. I want to eliminate aging or drift of sensor electronics, at least for optical sensors. Now, that, that is uh, not a factor simply because with the optical sensors, um, the optics, for one thing, are more stable. For, but for another thing, it's uh, not a big deal to incorporate uh, reference measurement into those optics so that um, the sensor can actually detect that drift and compensate for it automatically. So good thing for the customer here is that these style of measurements, the sensor is going to last a very long time and be very reliable. Well, uh, it's spring training out there, and uh, the uh, boys of summer are in Arizona and Florida and getting ready for the upcoming season. But I thought I would use uh, baseball as an example to, demonstrate, to uh, explain the difference between accuracy and precision, or an, precision, in other words, pre precision is repeatability. Because when you're noticing uh, measurement error or perceiving measurement error, it's important to differentiate between uh, those types of, of differences. So um, we have our left-handed batter up here. He's standing at the plate there. The strike zone, uh, for those of you not familiar with, with baseball, is the area in which the pitcher has to throw the ball in order to uh, get the batter out. Now, if the pitcher throws the ball and it's outside of that strike zone, the batter is not obliged to swing at it. And if enough, number, if enough of those pitches are outside that strike zone, the batter gets a free pass to go to first base. So, uh, as the pitcher, let, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm the pitcher and uh, I'm going to make sure that I get that ball inside the strike zone. So I'm going to aim for dead center of that strike zone. And so, maybe I'm pitching to the, the ninth man in the batting order. I don't have to worry about him hitting it too much or her. And uh, so, I pitch and I get three balls in the strike zone that the batter cannot hit. Um, it's an out, it's a strikeout. Um, but in this case, in this example, the pitcher has been accurate. All those balls are in the strike zone. All the pitches are in the strike zone, but not precise. Not one of them. Well, one of them is kind of close to the target, but the other two are kind of far away from the target. So that's an example of an accurate but not precise measurement. Let's look at another example. Again, the pitcher is going to aim for the middle of the strike zone to make sure that he gets all those pitches inside the strike zone. And he throws his first two pitches. And uh, the, uh, the pitches are, are, if we look at the uh, first two pitches, we see that, sorry, my animations advanced a little too fast. The first two pitches are, are very close together, but they're not very accurate because they're outside the strike zone. So as the pitcher, you can adjust that, adjust their target down and to the left. And now the next three pitches, uh, still very precise and in the strike zone, batter can't hit it and you get a strike zone, strikeout. So that's an example of a precise but not accurate measurement. So the, the point here is that um, you can always adjust the target. So precision is very important. So let's look at uh, some sample properties which uh, may cause uh, be cause for interferences. So air bubbles. Uh, you're in a activated sludge plant. You've got your sensor in the mixed liquor. Um, it's maybe above a diffuser where bubbles are interfering with the measurement. Those bubbles won't necessarily interfere with the accuracy. Your accuracy could be very, very well because those bubbles. Um, are not going to uh, be a continuous interference. They're only going to be when they actually hit the sensor face. But the precision could be very low because maybe every three or four uh, measurement cycles, 
you're going to get a bubble in the way and it's going to have an effect on the measurement. Could increase or decrease. So a uh, couple things, you could change the sensor position. You could move that sensor so it's not directly over a diffuser perhaps. Maybe you could put the sensor so it's in the uh, sample at an angle, for example, so bubbles would be less of a factor. Uh, but you can do one thing without even touching the sensor. You just go to the controller and increase the signal averaging. So I'll give a demonstration of that shortly. Another interference uh, is by uh, reflections. So reflections in a sample might be coming off um, the, uh, the walls of a pipeline, for example, if you have a particularly clear sample. And in this case, the accuracy is impacted, but not the precision, because that reflection is always going to be in the same place, and it's always going to have the same effect on the measurement. So this is especially, as I mentioned, a factor for insertion type mounts or pipeline type mounts. Again, you can change the sensor position. Uh, sometimes, and, and with the uh, IQ SensorNet, we have a, a marking aid, so you know exactly the orientation for that sensor in the pipeline to get the least interference. But in some cases, a user calibration will be necessary. And basically, it will be an offset. So the sensor can be told to not in interpret that reflection as signal from the sample, but in instead to uh, neglect that and start counting, um, start the signal where uh, the uh, solids are causing reflections. So uh, as I promised, a little demonstration of signal averaging. Um, I went into the labs here at, at YSI and uh, grabbed a, a bucket and a uh, aquarium diffuser stone and aquarium pump and I put it in the bucket. Oops, sorry. And uh, I needed to start the video. And so you can see the, the bubbles off that uh, diffuser stone are uh, coming up into the top of the sample. So I, I set that diffuser or that probe right over those bubbles, turned on the pump, um, and, and the effect w we observe is that the um, measurement is, is very, I'm going to pause this for a moment here. The measurement is very unstable. So um, as that measurement's bouncing around, as the bubbles are hitting it, so I, I can go in here to the programming and uh, go into signal averaging, which is deliberately set at one second. I wanted to get my, low, my biggest effect. I'm going to change it to 300 seconds, which is uh, another way of saying five minutes. Save and quit. Uh, go back to the measurement display. And now, um, and by the way, you can neglect the, uh, the measurement of 1,400 milligram per liter because that, again, that, that, that sensor is in clean water, but it's actually reflecting off the diffuser stone in there. So there is an environmental influence there that I, I haven't corrected. But anyway, you can see that now the, um, the measurement has become much more stable. Of course, the, the video just ended, but you can see there for the several seconds there that despite the fact that the bubbles uh, hitting the face of the sensor that that uh, measurement uh, became stable. Of course uh, there is uh, fouling that occurs. Um, could be organic. We're talking things like biomass. Uh, in this picture right here is um, shows maybe some sludge on the sensor. Grease is another another big uh, foulant. Could also be mineral, though. Uh, hard water, especially in clean samples, hard water scale can uh, interfere with the measurement. Or a lot of treatment plants add iron to the process to remove phosphorus, for example. Just like that iron can foul uh, UV disinfection, quartz sleeves can also foul the windows of the sensor. So uh, there's a number of cleaning mechanisms, uh, automatic cleaning built into various brands in the market. There's a mechanical wiper, which uh, intermittently, that wiper passes over the measuring window and wipes it off. You can use air blast or water blast to kind of uh, uh, dislodge that debris. Uh, YSI IQ SensorNet has uh, the only sensor with built-in ultrasonic cleaning. And ultrasonic cleaning basically shakes that measuring window at a very fast rate, prevents the onset of fouling, especially biological fouling, so that you can go longer in between 
uh, manual cleaning cycles. And of course, you can combine these. Uh, maybe uh, for our product, uh, the V solid sensor, we can also add air to, to the ultrasonic cleaning for especially uh, aggressive samples. Manual cleaning, as I earlier mentioned, though, is, is always going to be important. There's really no substitute for it. In the simplest instance, you just uh, uh, warm water or detergent, wipe that sensor off, restore it to a clean condition. In other cases, say where there's biological contamination, maybe grease that you can't get off the sensor face, uh, alcohol is, is a good um, ethanol, you know, like just rubbing alcohol can, can uh, eliminate that. If you've got scale or iron, though, um, you're going to need acid. So, for example, 5% um, HCl we recommend, but I think uh, other dilute acids will work just fine. And so, just as you may be a clear scale from a, a coffee pot or maybe the battery terminals on your kids' toys with vinegar, you can achieve that same effect with acid on the uh, sensor face. So, uh, I have a demonstration, a couple demonstrations of ultra clean technology here. But before I do, uh, I want to uh, describe the design of the V Solid 700 IQ solids probe. So. This is a stainless steel probe with sapphire. The little circle arrow cutouts there are sapphire measuring windows. So it's a very smooth, durable surface. That helps to prevent things from sticking to the surface. But in addition to that, we've got the continuous ultrasonic cleaning system. And some of the benefits of that over a wiper, for example, is, is the no, no, no risk of smearing and also no moving parts to replace. So if you've got a wiper, for example, you've got wipers that need to be replaced regularly, you've got a seal which needs to be replaced and probably needs to be done at the factory or sent back to the factory. Uh, no wear parts. So basically, that ultrasonic cleaning, it's, it's internal to the sensor. Uh, it is never going to need uh, to be maintained. So this is a produced video. Um, of the ultra clean technology with a visoturb. A visoturb is a uh, another probe in the IQ sensor net for monitoring turbidity. But we can see whatever fouling is on there um, with the ultra cleaning on. You can see it's it's dispersed after a minute, and then after three minutes, it's completely completely gone. Now uh, I went back into our labs here at at uh, YSI and did a, a little different demonstration. So I took a V solid sensor, put some uh, hand cream on it. Uh, nothing special, some uh, gold bond hand cream. Put it on pretty thick on the sensor face there. And uh, I then um, took the sensor, put it back into that bucket. I took the air stone out, of course, and um, let's see what's, uh, here we go, it's running. Um, put it in that bucket and let it, let it sit for a while. Again, this is, this is clean water. Um, Again, we got the uh, 2020 XT controller connected to it. I'll come in here. This time, I guess I used a, uh, a glass beaker so it'd be easier to see what was going on. Again, the uh, the beaker is, is not a good reference environment because there's going to be a lot of light and reflection off the surface. But uh, I turned on the ultrasonic cleaning, left and come back, and uh, see what happened. This has been about 15 minutes here, honestly. Um, and um, took, actually, you can see that the, uh, the hand cream is now in clumps. And you can see the last part of it is actually sliding off this very smooth face of that sensor. So uh, the Ultra Clean has, has helped to shake that loose. And the very smooth face of the sensor allows that contamination to just kind of um, slide off in this case. So. Um, hopefully that's, that's a helpful demonstration. That wasn't enough. Um, it, one thing to be in the lab, but it's another thing to actually be in the field. So uh, went out to one of our customers, which was a pure auction activated sludge facility. Those are notoriously known to be sticky sludges. Uh, we put the sensor, this, the sensors on the left there, there's three of them. We lower them below the grating into a return-activated sludge uh, channel. 
Um, we got two V solids with ultra clean and one FDO with no automatic cleaning, but um, kind of interested to see how that did as well, but also to balance the, uh, the triple sensor holder. And uh, we, we, we put it in there, we turned the ultra clean on, and uh, we got sensor number one and sensor number two there. Uh, one of them is in green and one of them is in, in red. Now, uh, they, they both uh, resisted fouling. I want to say that the spikes in the measurement here, spikes at the red sensor, uh, were the effect of, of rags and uh, other kind of bulk items that got in the sample. But you can see once those items are cleared, actually both of them got fouled right here, um, the uh, red and the green always restore to that, that good uh, stable condition. We did another one where we went back and we turned off the ultra clean on, on one of the sensors and left on the other. And so after we came back, after 10 days, we came back and uh, the sensor on the top had ultra clean off. And you can definitely see there's a whole lot more debris around the face of that sensor. On the bottom right with ultra clean on the entire time, definitely a, a cleaner uh, sensor face. Now, how did that translate into measurements? Well, uh, again, with the ultra clean um, off uh, on sensor number one, that's the green line, we can see actually that the, uh, the process, the sensor was very stable for several days, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But then on Wednesday, the sensor one with the ultra clean, sensor, ultra clean off, the sensor started to diverge a little bit. And, uh, just to show you that you know, fouling isn't necessarily a uh, linear process. Um, you know, there, there are times when it just started to diverge and other times where it made uh, big advancements. And again, once you've started the fouling, it's, it's very difficult to reverse that without manual cleaning. So, uh, but in this case, with sensor number two ultra clean on, um, it resisted the onset of that fouling so that uh, the customer can go a longer duration, in this case, at least 10 days before they have to go back and, and clean off that sensor. All right, well, thank you so much for your patience, but I have a few closing thoughts here before we move on to any, move on to your questions. So in summary, this webinar was about keeping sensors clean, especially optical sensors. And optical sensors, in particular, are based on light scattering, turbidity and total spin in solids, or light absorbance, uh, which uh, also could be a solids measurement, but is also used for things like nitrate and COD. IQ sensor and optical probe operation, and, and presumably other brands as well, require programming, at least at the uh, commissioning, and then uh, cleaning at regular manual cleaning. Uh, automatic cleaning, of course, this is going to be important to all sensors, but manual cleaning is going to be an important part of uh, your ownership as well. Uh, sample environment and fouling are causes of measurement error, and it's important to identify those. Uh, obviously, the rectifying uh, an error due to sample environment uh, is going to be much different from one for fouling. So. Um, the fouling is going to be something that is, uh, environment will be constant, the fouling is going to be variable. And last, uh, the IQ SN, IQ sensor and ultra clean technology, uh, the point of that is to extend those maintenance intervals so that uh, you can get the, the best data with the least amount of effort. I have here a, an example application then for how you might use solid sensors for process control. This is a diagram of an activated sludge facility. You've got an aeration tank with a, a known volume and a mixed liquor suspended solids concentration that can be measured with an immersion style V solid TSS probe. You've got a final clarifier where the solids are separated and then a return activated sludge is recycled back to the aeration tank and some of it is wasted with the wasted, waste activated sludge. But that 
RAS sludge can be monitored with an insertion style V-solid probe. And so the list price for the system shown here is a little over $15,000 for the two probes, a controller, output module so that you can get your signals, 4 to 20 milliamp, for example, into your uh, SCADA system, power supply module, cables and mounting equipment. Uh, pretty reasonable price, I think. Um, and really, it doesn't even, um, uh, it's not even, it doesn't even scale. I mean, so if you've got a 100,000 gallon per day plant, yeah, your investment is $15,000. That's a big chunk. But if you've got a million gallon per day treatment plant, you very well could get by with exactly the same setup for $15,000. Um, larger plants obviously may have multiple treatment trains that they want to measure. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of times, the wasted sludge is from a common uh, source anyway, and so uh, oftentimes monitoring sludge solids in one train is, is adequate. Another thing I want to point out there in this example, and it's true in a lot of treatment plants, is that the RAS concentration in this example, X sub bar is the RAS sludge concentration, and the waste activated sludge concentration are the same because you're wasting off the same line. So it's not necessary to monitor the waste line, you just need to monitor the uh, RAS line. Um, a tale of two water resource recovery facilities uh, to, who have implemented or have not implemented sludge wasting control. I would argue that the benefit of sludge wasting control is better sedimentation performance. So uh, the yellow line with the uh, magenta markers is a plant that had installed a sludge wasting control, automatic sludge wasting control with TSS sensors. And you can see they have a, a lower and more consistent SVI over time. Plant B in the same utility, similar style wastewater, did not have this uh, system. And that's the blue line with the yellow markers. And you can see that their SVI was much more variable and much higher, so much, much worse sedimentation performance. The red circle there at the end, which uh, we can see, is where uh, the operators at plant B caught wind of what was going on at plant A and uh, programmed their wastewater treatment. They op started operating their wastewater treatment plant to mimic plant A. And of course, um, their SVIs also came down, proving that they didn't even need a sensor or any investment to get the benefit. Um, I also want to, although we talked about, uh, for the most part, suspended solids and scattered light measurement, uh, UltraClean is also available on IQ SensorNet UV and UV Vis probes. So these are, for example, the CarboViz, the NitroViz, the NICOViz, UVT254 and the NOx um, picture on the bottom right there is, is what one of those probes look like. Um, and we have a little short video here showing, again, how the UltraClean technology is able to uh, clear contamination of the measuring windows. The measuring windows are in the, in the middle there. And this is an ab absorb, absorbent style sensor. So uh, you're measuring how much light travels how much the light intensity travels through that gap and reaches the detector. Um, even more so than scattered light sensors, the fouling can have a very uh, fast and detrimental effect on measurement of COD and nitrate. And there's the video ends. You can see that the, uh, the fouling has been cleared. Um, we do have some time for questions, and I'm looking forward to taking those questions. Um, if we don't get to all your questions today, we will follow up with the email address that you gave when we registered. And there's also uh, fantastic resources on the web, SlideShare, YouTube, the good old telephone, and also uh, email. Before we proceed to the questions, though, I want to quickly uh, tell you that um, now available from YSI as part of the IQ SensorNet is the 282-284 controller. 
this is going to be a replacement for the 182, which um, our existing customers know about. It's got kind of the uh, similar uh, design of the 182, but it's got all the functionality of the 2020 XT controller. Also, uh, not part of the IQ sensor net, but also uh, part of um, YSI's environment or water quality system sampling systems offering is the ProSample P, which is a uh, portable sampler. Okay, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Teresa here, and uh, meanwhile, put this slide back up for you for reference. Great. Thanks, Rob. I'm pretty excited about the 282-284, and I, I think all of our customers will be too, so it's very exciting. Okay, our first question, and, and remember too, if you guys have any questions, feel free to type them in on that right panel. Um, beginning with question one, um, can I use a handheld water quality instrument to verify TSS? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. and. Uh, Handhelds can be used under uh, very specific conditions, uh, keeping in mind that um, a handheld may have different optics, as I mentioned earlier. Um, that handheld has to be a uh, calibrated handheld. So um, just taking your handheld out there and um, not calibrated uh, and trying to verify a process instrument, maybe a different brand, maybe a different technology, is not recommended. But if you uh, want to use the handheld to maybe re say you've got a lot of basins you have to measure and you want to calibrate that handheld once on one basin and then use it for the rest of the day or the week or whatever on your other basins, that is acceptable. But, but keeping in mind that, um, uh, that the, the optics have a, a large effect on the, uh, the uh, measurement. Great. Uh, question, the second question. Um, is there any way to know if the ultra-clean is working correctly? That, that, that's a good question, too, actually. Um, yeah, with a wiper or air, you can see what's happening, right? Um, with ultra-clean, um, you don't know if you're getting the best performance or not. One thing I, you are able to do, though, is um, very easily um, uh, you can actually feel that shaking if you touch the sensor face, so where the measuring windows are. So when you first order it, you plug it in, um, feel that face, the sensor, so you can, you can feel that shaking in your fingertip. But any time afterwards, uh, that is a suitable way to do it as well. Um, of course, you can always repeat the demonstrations I did here today. It's a lot of trouble for you probably, but... Um, yeah, that's just a couple ideas that you, you can actually feel that shaking of the ultra clean on the sensor face. How is it uh, possible to measure solids retention time with a TSS sensor? Uh, yeah, okay, great. So um, evidently at least one person stayed on the uh, webinar to the end. Um, so, yeah, we're not actually measuring SRT with a suspended solid sensor. What we're doing, and I didn't show the equation, is actually uh, doing a mass balance on that system so that we know the solids in and the solids out. We can then calculate, it's a very simple arithmetic actually, the um, amount of, the volume of sludge that you need to waste. So, for example, you can calculate uh, the, the actual flow rate in your waste sludge pump if you've got one if that's how you waste. Um, in a previous webinar, we talked about that in a little more detail. Uh, the one we did uh, last fall, we gave some, uh, some case studies, I think, but uh, I, I encourage you to uh, watch that webinar as well for, for more insights on that specific application. So we got another one, another question about TSS, it, and it uh, says, what is the difference in the measurement between TSS and turbidity? Yeah, so uh, TSS and turbidity are actually kind of uh, very, very similar measurements. Turbidity has the maybe the longer history, um, but turbidity is, is very well defined as the measurement of, 
of scattered light at a 90 degree angle. Um, and so that's that's what defines turbidity, and then it's it's reported in units of uh, NTU or FNU, and um, so actually the verification of that uh, turbidity is is very simple. It's a very simple measurement because it is what it is. Um, whatever causes turbidity, um, it, it doesn't matter so much what it is. Um, on the other hand, suspended solids uh, is more of an empirical measurement, and, and it can be implemented in many different ways in different brands of sensors. So, for example, um, in order to measure higher solids concentrations requires using our, a scattered light angle of uh, less than 90 degrees. So, um, the uh, different brands will have different design for their optics. Um, and another important part about turbidity as well is there are various turbidity standards, whereas for total suspended solids, uh, not so much. So with turbidity, there are two standards I can think of. There's a US EPA's uh, standard, um, and that's very specific about the type of light and the uh, optics that are used. Um, on the other hand, there's an ISO standard, ISO standard, which uh, also is specific, but the requirements are slightly different. The, the Visoturb and most uh, online suspended solid sensors conform to that ISO standard, not to the US EPA standard, which is why we tell our customers that they can't use the Visoturb or our turbidity probes as a compliance instrument, for example, in a drinking water plant. So long answer to a simple question. Thank you. Okay, we got a, another really good question. Um, other than routine maintenance, is there yearly maintenance such as replacement of O-rings that must occur? So um, it depends on the, the type of, of uh, uh, the brand use. As I mentioned, just to reiterate with the UltraClean, uh, there's never anything to replace with that. All the All the parts are internal and they last many, many years. Um, another brand though, let's say you have air cleaning added. Um, you know, that, that air pump uh, may wear out over time. Um, depends on how often you do the air cleaning. But if you've got uh, a different brand, say with a wiper, for example, those wipers are going to wear out and uh, they'll need to be replaced. And it's not a huge, that, that wiper replacement is, from what I understand, is not a big deal. But where you really get into Maybe something that is not convenient is when the seals, so there's a shaft, that wiper is coupled to something inside the sensor. And when that seal needs to be replaced, it needs to be done every year or two, I think. Uh, that either has to be done by a factory person or the sensor needs to be set into the factory. Otherwise, you, you risk uh, avoiding the warranty, which is uh, you know, not something you want to do. And of course, in worst cases, if that seal isn't done properly, you're going to get water intrusion into the electronics and, and ruin the sensor. Thanks for the question. I think we've got uh, time for maybe one more question. Um, what is the V-solid solid sensor measuring range? I, another excellent question. So um, the, the V-solid is really uh, very strong up to 25,000 or even 30,000 milligram per liter. So it's going to work very well in mixed liquor suspended solids. Um, in primary sludge or thickened sludge, um, the, the factory calibration is going to be probably good up to um, that level or maybe even a little higher. Um, but it's going to be very application specific as to whether that and I'm talking in, in the instance of the V-solid, uh, whether it can reach, say, 4% or even 6% solids. Um, the higher in concentration you get, uh, we strongly recommend that the customer uh, try it out on site first uh, to make sure that they're satisfied with the performance. Now, I don't want also either to give you the wrong idea that the V-solid is just not suitable for that application, but it is in fact um, a problem for all optical style sensors. Um, 
as I mentioned, a lot of things impact that um, the optics and whether it's the light actually penetrating into the sample or the reflected light actually getting back into the detector. So uh, I would recommend with, with optical style sensors, when you get into some of those uh, more concentrated thick and sludge applications that um, the vendors should prove that they can they can do it. Great. Thanks, Rob. Um, and thanks for all the great questions that came in today. Um, we are going to conclude at this time. We really appreciate you attending today's webinar, and we hope that you found it useful. Um, please complete the brief survey. It should pop up here at the end, and uh, it'll help us better serve you in the, in, for future webinars. Um, if we were not able to get to your question today, we will follow up with you directly uh, via email. So um, once again, thanks for attending, and we hope to see you next time.